Hi, everyone. It's trying just doing a sound check. We can hear you. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start in a few minutes. We're just waiting for folks to come in.
Hi, everybody. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, we are going to go and uh, get started um, since it's 4.06 and presumably more people will trickle in, but welcome to the March 2022 CAG meeting. It is our 19th meeting. Um, thank you for making the time to be here. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Desiree to get us started. Thanks, Paula. <clears throat> um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share my screen in just one second. Okay, let's see. Um, Okay, share screen. Okay, can you see that okay? Good, all right, great, wonderful. Um, so welcome everyone to meeting number 19 as uh, Paula had mentioned. Um, so this, uh, this meeting is going to focus on um, the Section 3 MWBE quarterly update. Um, we, you know, we had mentioned that as soon as the litigations were over, um, we would be able to provide an update uh, with those numbers that we had presented back in the fall. Um, so we pulled that together and we have our subconsultant Bowie Studios um, here with us tonight to be able to um, present that. Um, again, oh, I forgot the beginning spiel. I'm Desiree Gazza. <laughs> from the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project. Um, I'm here with my colleagues from HNTB Lero, the Program Management Construction Management Group, um, as well as DDC. Um, and as I mentioned, we have our um, hiring compliance uh, subconsultant, Bowie Studios, with us as well. Um, so the highlights for uh, today, I will quickly start off with a few community resources and outreach, um, and then I'll hand the mic over uh, to Trang who will present the Section 3 MWBE quarterly update. Um, and then we'll go into overview of contracts, uh, air quality update, uh, construction updates, and then we have a few um, what we've heard items tonight as well. And Paula and Tara did send us over the questions that were um, sent via email to be addressed for this meeting. Um, so we will speak to some of them tonight. Um, one or two of them came in a little bit uh, late. So um, if there's anything that we don't cover tonight, we will provide um, a written response. So um, please, you know, just um, understand that. Um, okay, so let's start. Um, so I think hopefully everyone had seen um, the CB3 uh, presentation from the other week. Um, you know, it's we're trying to reduce the number of slides here and redundancy um, for information that that was covered in the CB3 meeting. So I do hope everyone did get a chance um, to, to watch that. Um, I did want to include this slide again um, because it does offer uh, the community resources. Um, once again, we have our bilingual CCLs. Um, we do provide presentations at CB3 um, and six, the community advisory group. Um, we are open and willing to present to, at tenant association meetings. We've, I think, presented at one or two um, only, but we would be very happy to um, come, you know, meet in person and uh, present and respond to any questions at tenant association meetings. So please, if you um, feel that your community would, you know, benefit from having us come, please, again, reach out and we can certainly um, attend. Uh, we attend community board district cabinet meetings. We meet with elected officials and um, we meet with other community groups as well um, as requested. Uh, starting in the spring and continuing into the summer, we are really hoping to be out in the community more through in-person uh, tabling. Uh, and again, within the community and within the park, um, if you would like us to table at, you know, within your neighborhood or, or at your building or development, please reach out. Um, I mean, you could reach out through Paula and Tara, or you could reach out to our CCLs and we will 
um, work on a date where we could schedule things. Um, we do need for many developments, we do need um, kind of approval from the management group or the, um, you know, whoever is, is running that, that, um, that location. Um, and then for if we're tabling in the street, we do have to coordinate that or on the sidewalk rather, um, we do have to coordinate that with D DOT. Um, so it does require, you know, some advanced uh, coordination. We can't just kind of show up the next day. So we will, um, we do ask if you are interested in having us come table, um, we certainly can, uh, can do that <clears throat> um, as, as we have in the past. Um, community resources. Uh, when we spoke with Paula and Tara, um, they had requested that we perhaps just go over the Parks Neighborhood Recreational Resources. Um, so if you go to the Esker homepage, which I hope everyone is very familiar with, um, there are a bunch of quick links um, down here on the bottom of the page. So this is the homepage. Um, and there is this kind of lime green one here. And this is the parks that you could click on it. Um, or the text down here and it brings you to the parks neighborhood recreational resources page which is this here so this will pop up um, and this is the map of the um, neighborhood recreational resources that parks put together um, as part of one of the commitments for the east side coastal resiliency project um, there's also this um, link here which goes directly to to the um, to the website but essentially, and I'll go to the next page, um, you can click on the activity or amenity that you're looking for within your neighborhood. Um, so if you pick baseball, softball, then the parks within the area that have baseball and softball amenities will kind of like highlight on the map. So it's an interactive map and you could click on, I think you could actually click on several at a time um, if, if not, then at least one, and you could kind of scroll through to see um, if you're, you know, again, if you're looking for playgrounds in the area, or if you're looking for basketball fields, uh, Parks Department keeps this uh, pretty much up to date. Um, again, you know, and as the East River Park closes, they're also keeping that, as you can see here, the red area indicates the closed area. Um, so they're working to keep that updated as well. So please check this out if you haven't, um, if you haven't already. Um, again, this was one of the project commitments. So they are, you know, working to keep that updated um, as much as possible, um, especially with the, you know, but all the amenities and activities are, are built in there. So if, if anybody has any questions, again, feel free to reach out to through the inquiry tool or through the CCLs or through Paula and Tara, and we'd be happy to um, happy to address those. Um, I again, I I don't know how many folks were able to um, make the CB3 meeting, um, so I, I do think it is very important, and I'm not gonna. I did spend a little bit more time on this, um, you know, at the CB3 meeting, so. You know, please feel free to to check check that meeting out. But I just wanted to at the last CAD meeting we had um, a slide that showed the banners that we had put up the decorative um, the decorative mesh fence that had a lot of good information about the project. It, it spoke to um, the flood protection. It spoke to it had where the walls would be and where the park would be raised. It spoke to um, some of the planting and resiliency and and all of these uh, slides are still on the website that you could that you could see um, not the slides rather the decorative the panels that were up um, and within less than a week I think um, all of the panels were vandalized uh, very significantly um, and we needed to take them all down um, so you know and we understand that there are um, you know, protests and 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 everybody has you know that right to to their speech and their thoughts. But um, this really is for the community, and we're trying to again put out information um, for the community. And it was you know very um, just upsetting and and really a shame that 
bees couldn't stay up for more than a week um, without being, again, you know, significantly vandalized. Um, our CCLs went out um, within the first couple of days when there was just kind of marker on it and, and flyers and tried to kind of wipe them down. Um, and while they were out there, again, trying to just take the some of the material that was on them, um, they did get approached by someone on a bicycle that was yelling at them and um, like following them with the bicycle. And, you know, our CCLs are, are out there, um, you know, to, to help folks understand what, what's happening with the project. And, um, you know, they've been responding to a lot of calls that the Parks Department has been receiving. Um, there was recently, um, on social media, there was a, a large, you know, campaign to call um, the Parks Department about the tree removals again, which is which is fine. Um, and the, the Parks has been directing the, you know, the calls to the CCLs because it's more than just the tree removals, it's about the project. Um, and this is one of the voicemails here um, that our CCLs, both of our CCLs received. Um, this person did um, call both and leave a similar message um, on both CCL's machines. So it really is not, not appropriate. I mean, we understand that there are wide range of emotions about this project, but our community construction liaisons are really trying, you know, to just do their job and, and, you know, they didn't make the decisions that are, you know, result, which is this project for, you know, flood protection. And we really do hope that you know, as a community, we can find a way to be kind to, you know, the people who are working on the project. Um, so, uh, you know, we want to move forward with being out in the park and tabling and being out in the community, but, you know, if we can't be out there if it's not safe. So um, we have been working with NYPD on some of the, the kind of threats that we've received, um, and we will continue to because it's just not that's just not not right. Our community construction liaisons need to feel safe out in the neighborhood. So I did just want to bring that up again, because I do think it's really important, um, because we are really trying to, you know, put out information and we have more banners. Um, and we were going to put banners up in Corlears Hook Park too, which related to Corlears Hook Park and really all throughout the park. Um, and we also have the call for art um, banners that are going to go up and we just really you know, those are, that's art from the community. So we do really um, hope that everybody can be respectful of that. Um, so I um, will end on that and I will uh, pass it over to Trang Bui, who is our sub-consultant for um, hiring uh, for the project. And um, then after she speaks, we'll take questions and then move on to the construction uh, information. So. Trang, I will pass it to you. Thanks, Desiree. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be back. And um, I know you haven't seen these slides for a while, so I just wanted to remind you of um, some of the basis for the numbers. Um, the program management and construction management team, as well as the general contractor teams, were hired based on their proposed uh, qualifications and the MWBE um, utilization plan. So a lot of the teams that came into this project were already pre-packaged with known subcontractors. And that um, explains why a lot of the total staff um, are existing versus new hires, especially on the PMCM side. Um, so I, I think we've been getting a lot of questions about hiring opportunities, but strictly speaking for the the consultant side, uh, we came in with um, a group of uh, existing staff and there's just been a, a limited number of new hires. On the contracting side, a lot of the new hires are coming from the, the unions. And uh, I think we've talked about this in previous presentations and that that's a separate um, challenge when it comes to trying to marry the new hiring with the local hiring and the section three hire, um, hiring goals that we're trying to meet on this program. In the past, there were also interest in um, the male and female breakdown of our teams. And again, um, the requirement on the federal side for the trades is 6.9% uh, for female hires. And the industry average on the construction management side is 
around 7.7%. And we're very excited to report that our, our PMCM team is currently at 25% in terms of um, female hires on the program. And you see that here on, on our, when we go out to the community and do the presentations, but there's also um, the back office opportunities. There are a lot of um, females in meaningful leadership roles on the program. So just to recap some of the numbers here, out of the 88 total staff, we do we have eight new hires and that's again, um, the majority, I think we could go to the next slide, Desiree, um, are coming from our MWB subs because these were what we were projecting as part of our utilization plan. So um, even though the, I believe the current goal for the MWB for the PMCM team is 31%, the, the subs, the staff coming from our subs are, at 34% um, and make up the majority of, of the new hires. So we're definitely on track to meet the goals and the projections that we thought we were gonna be using our subs. Uh, on the GC side, they're, they're over 50% of, of um, staff coming from their MWB also um, as part of their anticipation to meet their goals. And right now they're at 14% of new hires coming from these subs. Uh, next slide. There was also interest in um, the residency of the team members on the program. And again, since we came in with existing staff, that explains the, um, the breakdown of the diversity uh, in the geography of the staff that's working on this project. But we are with every um, opening that comes up on the program, we do look at um, we do try to track local um, applicants and we're also recruiting from local resources. So that um, always a, plays a, a, a key role in some of our um, recruitment um, strategies to make sure that we're including um, opportunities listing with um, local partners that do recruitment from section three um, programs, workforce development programs, um, and local hiring in the community. On the section three new hires progress, the we're operating under the old HUD section three rule. So that means 30% of new hires um, are targeted for section three individuals, which are um, defined as either um, residents of public housing or low-income individuals. And on the PMCM side, we're at 42% toward our, our progress to meeting the goal. And the GC are still working very hard, but once again, their new hires are coming from the unions. And the because Section 3 is based on um, income, it's been a challenge for them in terms of getting union employees who actually um, would meet that income criteria. So they are trying to look at um, apprenticeships and um, training programs to see if they could um, work on some pipelines to getting individuals into um, the unions. And then again, on the MWBE goals, the PMCM team's goal is at 31%. And right now we're projecting to be 29% of our, our goal based on the task orders that have been issued. And on the GC side, their goal is 12%. And the current calculation is around 21%. And the, all of these numbers are, since we're, we're talking about projected progress because we're, we're still vetting a lot of the numbers that are coming in because we want to um, check against what's projected versus the actual payments that have been made. And there's always a, a lag with that in terms of when the payments are made and when they're entered into the city system to be recorded as the official um, actual amounts paid. And that's just um, a preview of what our quarterly report is we wanted to get this data out to you sooner rather than later, but our our quarterly reporting cycle is actually going to be at the end of um, this month to actually capture all of March because this, this data is only through February. 
And we could go into the next slide. So obviously we want to do better than what we've been doing on the local hiring and the section three. And these are some of the strategy and good faith efforts that we've, we've been um, working on and expanding to meet these goals. Um, DDC has been talking to the um, Mayor's Office of Workforce Development as one of the partners to see if we could get more um, engagement with the unions. We know that the contractors each time that there is a, a hiring need, they do send out letters to the unions that they're, um, they're pulling from to remind them of the Section 3 and local hiring um, requirements. So we're documenting all of that as part of our good faith efforts. Um, there's also, we're doing our quarterly information session and we just had one last month. I think Desiree um, gave you a briefing on that. And um, the last one we did, we, instead of just talking about um, the job opportunities, we expanded it to more of a resource fair to also um, prepare firms and individuals on other resources to help prepare them either for, for potential openings on this program or other programs out, outside of this project that have similar um, needs or skill sets. And then we're, we're always updating any um, resources, events, and job postings as they become available on the, during the, week, the weekly um, email blast from, from Esker. And then here's just a listing of some of the city and local partners we've been working with. And we're also always looking to um, see if there are new, new programs from some of the partners or if they're starting up their training programs now that um, some of the COVID restrictions have been lifted to, um, to add to the resources that we could list and, um, and also potentially partner with on, on future events. And then I just wanted to highlight this. Um, DDC held its uh, design build forum on, on Wednesday and, and we presented there along with um, six other uh, design build teams. And it, it had a really good turnout with over 280 attendees. And they talked about subcontracting opportunities um, on, on DDC projects uh, citywide. And we, we mentioned the S opportunities for ESCAR as well. And um, I wanted to highlight this because on the design build programs, there are um, no restrictions on the different tiers of subcontracting opportunities where you could count MWBE credit. And suppliers are also credited. And then they're also allowing city and state certified MWB firms to, to get credit on those projects. So that's a lot more flexible than what we have on the ESCAR program. So if there are limited opportunities for those firms here, because a lot of the teams have already been formed, this is a great um, opportunity to look at other programs where you could start out on a smaller scale and build capacity and capabilities moving up. So um, that's pretty much what we have to update and um, we'll work on getting the quarterly um, numbers next that will include this month's um, data as well. Thanks, Chang. <clears throat> um, so now we can take questions before we go to the second part of our presentation, if there are any. I'm just taking a quick look. Oh, it looks like we have one, Wendy. Hi there. Um, I noticed on the park map, you don't include walking or biking or dogs runs. Those are all three very important um, things that people did in the park. And I hope that they can be added um, to that map. And then I'd also like to request that any staff person who's speaking on this Zoom, please turn your camera on as a matter of common courtesy. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. We could certainly um, pass that over to Parks. They manage that um, GIS map, so we'll pass that over to them. Thanks. That's a good point. All right, Martin. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to figure out when there will be 
a uh, an area in by Stuyvesant Cove Park or the, the northern part that we would be able to do our concert series. In, in, in looking at the um, project update on the uh, website, it, it's not clear in so far as when there will be a, a, an actual black top or something that we could actually use. Uh, actually, the um, you know in, it, it indicates a uh, phase one, a phase one and a two, but the actual uh, area is is showing phase two and phase three. I'm not quite sure what what what's the differential. But again, it's not clear if, in fact, say uh, this uh, this summer. There, there will actually be some area in the northern part of the park that's finished. Sure. So, Martin, if it's okay, um, once we get into the second part, I'll have the slide for Stye Cove Park up um, with the schedule there. So, if that's okay, I could speak to I'll it. Wait. I'll, I'll wait. Fine. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right. Uh, it looks like the, that's all for questions for now. So, we can continue. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, okay, so let me see. <clears throat> so for overview of contracts, um, not much has changed, I don't believe, since the last uh, CAG meeting uh, for project area one. Um, it, we're moving forward and uh, the Delancey Street Bridge and Corlears Hook Bridge um, are the, the two kind of main items that are coming up here. Um, for project area two, um, you know, and we'll get into that in just a bit, but the highlight here is about 800 feet of flood wall have been installed um, to date. And the first floodgate was installed um, just a few weeks ago. So that's, you know, really great progress that they're making um, up in the north in project area two. Um, and then as we've mentioned at the last meetings, the bids were open for parallel conveyance. The procurement period is still ongoing um, and we have the website here where you could view the preliminary um, bid results. Um, so for project area two and Martin, now I could speak to speak to this. Um, so the construction progress, um, I think the last time we presented um, many of the areas that are that are on here, which are in, in this kind of pinkish color here, um, we were doing um, flood wall foundation. Um, we've now moved into flood wall construction on almost every um, on almost every portion of, of the of the northern part here that's in pink. Um, the Astor Levy playground. I have a couple of photos in the next slide here. The park reconstruction is moving right along. Um, the basketball courts are up, the, um, a lot of the benches are in. Um, you know, again, I'll show you that in the next, in the next piece, but it is um, scheduled to open again very soon. We've just reached the first day of spring. Um, so it is very exciting. And um, with that will come the opening of Astor Levy Playground. So we're very excited about that. Um, the, at East 15th Street between Avenue C and the FDR Drive, again, this is within the Con Ed facility. Um, there is sewer reconstruction coordination um, and subsurface investigation there. Um, and then along the FDR, or rather under the FDR Drive, where that exit seven um, ramp is, um, there will be some ongoing Con Ed work in the area. There, there was a traffic lane um, closure at some point that work has been put on hold, but you know it may uh, come back over there. Um, we'll let you know. We'll put out an advisory if if that should happen again. Um, but it is kind of ongoing, and again, that's Con Ed work, so we are we don't have that much control over when um, they they they're going to work in that area. But um, we did begin the pile installation um, and some utility work under the FDR within the fence, fenced area. So there is um, kind of across from Murphy Brothers Playground, there's kind of a fenced area under the FDR where the trailers are for the project. Um, so the pile installation work did um, start in that area there. 
Um, and then Martin, as you were saying, and as the, um, I think this schedule here might be just a little different the way it's graphically illustrated than what's on the website. Um, but the Stuyvesant Cove Park, the northern part, which is kind of north of, of East 20th Street, um, we will be looking to um, complete that before the end of the year. Um, and, you know, as of right now, it looks like it, it will um, kind of be, um, again, hopefully ready to open closer to, you know, maybe sometime within the fall than actually um, in December. You know, I know we've talked about um, with Solar One the the area up here in the blacktop area and the temporary restoration, um, and I believe that is um, within the summer. But I will get back to you, Martin, on um, what exactly that date is looking like. Um, but it is scheduled before the end of the year to again reopen that northern part of Stuyvesant Cove Park before taking um, more of the southern. Uh, the southern portion of Stuyvesant Cove Park. Um, and then again, once Asser Levy um, opens, then the contractor um, can move into um, the portions of Murphy Brothers Playground. Um, so, you know, we'll provide updates as uh, Stuyvesant Cove, as Project Area 2 moves along. But Martin, I'll get back to you on, on the concert series uh, question that you asked. <clears throat> Um, okay, so here are a few construction photos. So as you can see, the basketball backstops are up, the, um, the benches are there. I think there were some tables back here in the back. Um, the play equipment has started to arrive. The swings are up over here. Um, and then the play equipment has started to arrive. So as that all comes in, um, you'll see the, the playground being erected. Um, the wall is completed in this area. The gate has not yet arrived yet. So this is a slide gate different than the swing gate that we had shown that was installed um, down by Solar One. So the slide gate has a little area here and I'll try and get a better picture for the next presentation if, if folks are interested, but the slide gate will be housed kind of behind this mini wall here um, and it'll sit there against the flood wall and then it will be kind of pulled out um, where this opening is um, here, which uh, separates kind of the two areas of Astor Levy Playground um, in a case of a, you know, a storm um, emergency. So um, we are, again, moving along. There's still the safety surface that needs to be put in place here, but Astor Levy is, you know, very close to being completed and, and open for use again. Um, the February AQM air quality monitoring update, um, the 24 hour time weighted average um, was not surpassed for the month of February. Um, it was levels of particulate matter were surpassed um, in those 15 minute averages. Again, not the 24 hour average in the 15 minute average. So there were several occasions where um, an elevated level happen for a duration of 15 minutes or less, um, at which point the PM levels decreased. Um, there were higher levels for a bit longer period of time on February 22nd, um, but that was due to exhaust from an excavator working directly um, near the monitors. Uh, again, the net PM did not surpass uh, the PEL, that's the 24, um, the 24 time weighted average. Uh, the, the, um, and those are the Astor Levy Playground monitors, the ones that are closer to Sty Cove, which are the SO monitors, uh, those PM levels were below the PEL uh, for the month of February. Um, so we'll get into project area one now. Um, so the AQM for February, uh, there were no um, exceedances for February for project area one. So for upcoming construction activities, again, I only have a slide on this because most of the updates were given at the CB3 meeting. So if you do want a full um, update, please go back to the CB3 meeting. Um, these, are the, these are the highlights. I could certainly you know, answer any questions that you have here as well, um, but we did give a longer update at the CB3 meeting. Um, 
So again, there are shallow clearing and grubbing activities and Con Edison utility work um, in the closed part of the area. Um, there's also, you know, the, the majority of the Con Ed work is at the ferry landing, which is down here by the passive lawn. Um, that's the number two. And then at the Houston Street um, overpass, which is this number five area. Um, this area will continue to be closed um, into the into the summer. Um, again, it, it is Con Ed work, so it is at the schedule of Con Ed. Um, so this area here will be closed through the summer. Um, I do have this on the what we've heard slide, but we did um, just inform parks of that. Uh, and so they are they will be assessing the entrances to the fields in that area. I know that that was um, a concern and a question. Um, so they will be assessing that um, again now that they are aware that the that area will be closed um, through the summer. The Corlier's Hook Park partial closure is scheduled to begin the week of April 4th. Um, again, that's a partial closure. As you can see here, it is only this kind of northern or north uh, eastern portion of Corlier's Hook Park. Um, and then along the FDR Drive is that will be kind of the access uh, in and out of the area for the work that needs to be done in there. Um, we did have slides on that at the CB3 meeting. So again, you know, please reference, um, reference that. Uh, the Delancey Street pedestrian bridge overnight center span removal uh, will be on March 27th. That's a Sunday. Um, so it will start at 12.01 a.m. Sunday morning um, and continue through till 10 a.m. Um, so, and they will remove that center span. Um, if you've seen the two, the ramps are down on both sides um, and it's just that center span that's remaining. So that will be, again, an overnight full closure of the FDR. Um, they will reopen parts of the FDR from my understanding, um, you know, at, if the work allows, um, again, they're bringing in a pretty big piece of equipment there to, to remove that center span. Um, again, but that operation is from 12 to 10. Um, the Delancey Street sidewalk uh, also continues to be closed. Um, I guess it's really like the FDR service road um, that, that where the closure is. Um, we are working with DOT on, I know there were several requests for um, a uh, kind of a pedestrian lane there. Um, once the bridge is down, there will they will start working um, on putting in the foundations um, and, and work for the, the new bridge that's going to be put there. Um, so there are, you know, the team is under conversations with DOT um, just to, again, see if that is feasible to have pedestrians under there. Um, you know, when in the near future we will, you know, the, the work to start building the bridge will um, ultimately begin. So again, we just want, you know, all the pedestrians to be safe. And if you are running or walking there, you know, you really should, um, you know, go around the, the block to, um, again, for its safety and really pay attention to the sidewalk closures because, you um, there is, you know, there is construction work there and there will continue to be construction work that's that's going on. Um, so again, it's we're still coordinating with DOT on that, but we did just want to bring um, bring that up. Um, and then again, let's see, there is some um, Con Ed work at Montgomery Street and South Street. Sorry, I'm going a bit out of order. Um, and there will be um, kind of throughout the project area where the, the wall um, is going to be. But And right now that is um, Montgomery Street and South Street and that is Con Ed work. And we've been um, in coordination with Gouverneur Gardens who's right on the corner there, um, providing them updates for that. Um, so what we've heard, um, we did receive the CAG letter on air filter requests. Um, and there were a couple of item, other items in that letter. So we are um, working to provide responses for that. Um, so I will not have responses for those items um, today. Um, for PA1 lighting and temporary paths, um, the temporary paths 
um, down by the Houston Street ramp, um, and that connects from the shared use path to the Esplanade was repaved, I believe, last week. Um, it was re-asphalted. I haven't been able to get out there to the site. Um, I will next week, though, but I have been told that the, again, those paths have been re-asphalted. Um, and that uh, between within this week, the lighting, um, we're working on, you know, the, the requests for the lighting in that area. Um, the ones directly at the Houston Street ramp, we were coordinating with DOT on that. Again, it's interesting because it's in a parks park, but DOT manages the lighting, um, but we need to determine if the, the light, the outages were due to construction or if they were just due to, um, you know, just, again, just bulbs that need to be replaced. So that um, coordination is ongoing there. Uh, we are looking into lighting along, again, what we're calling the Stanton Street, I guess, pass, which connects the um, shared use path to the Esplanade. We've, re excuse me, we've received um, one or two comments that it is kind of dark in that area. So we are looking into that as well while we have folks out there um, with the night work that is happening. Um, and then there were also uh, questions down by the ferry landing. Um, about the, the lighting down there by the Esplanade um, and our contractors are working on that lighting. Uh, so we are, again, looking to make those improvements. Um, if there are any other areas that, you know, that, that are noticed, please, um, please do reach out. <clears throat> um, for the bald field entrances, as I mentioned, we are working with parks on that. Again, we just gave them, provided them with an updated schedule. Um, so permitted activities have started in the ball fields and they will be assessing um, those, those entrances. Um, for park security, uh, we again are continuing to coordinate with parks PEP and NYPD. Uh, there was a question about um, patrolling in the park and again, we did um, direct that over to Parks and we are working with them on a response. So we don't have um, a response tonight, but as soon as we get that response, we will um, provide it to Paula and Tara. Um, and then for parallel conveyance, um, a standalone meeting with DEP will be scheduled for the end of, hopefully the end of April. Um, getting everyone's schedules together is a bit challenging, um, but, we are looking, you know, we are actively coordinating with DEP on that. So those were the updates we had. Again, I think one or two other questions were sent over to us um, just before the meeting. Uh, so we will provide written responses to those, you know, and or address at the next meeting. Um, but again, we'll try to provide written responses to those so you don't have to wait the whole month. Thank you, Desiree. Um, Michael, you're, you're up. Thanks. Um, hey, Desiree, nice to see you again. Um, so first, I wanted to thank you for organizing um, that walkthrough last month with the whole team at Corlears. Um, and I don't know if you've been in the park lately, but a lot of the plantings that we asked to be moved have been moved already. So we're very happy about that. There's uh, a few more left, um, as well as the benches um, uh, to deal with. Um, but I had one question. I did watch the CB3 video. I was unfortunately unable to make the meeting um, due to a death in the family. But um, what I didn't see an answer to was something that we've been asking quite often, and that is the closures at Four Lears, um, why the whole FDR path is being closed if the parallel conveyance work isn't starting yet. Did you ever yeah. get a on that? Yeah, so I think um, I think the main reason for that, and I will confirm, but I think that is what they're using as kind of a construction access for the work, so that it doesn't, so that folks don't have to go in through the park. Um, so I will confirm that, but I believe that was one of the reasons for closing down that area, so that that again can be used for. Um, access as necessary. Um, it's also because we are working, you know, on that slope where the bridge comes down and I don't um, have uh, the map with me right now, but that, you know, you know, the slope that comes down on the 
kind of south side of the bridge, um, we don't want to create a dead end area there. Um, so we wouldn't want people that have to just run up to the, the closed area that will be closed due to construction and then have to turn around and go back. So I believe it's a function of both, but I can get you a more concrete answer on that and apologies for not responding to that sooner. No problem. And the last thing, sorry, Paula, <laughs> the last thing is um, uh, now that the warmers, the weather has become warmer, um, it might be beneficial if Joyce has time to go back out and try to catch some of the Chinese gardeners, because I have been seeing them already tending to those plots. Um, so obviously the, the message isn't getting to them because they're starting to plant stuff in there already. Yeah, and I think Joyce, and I think Joyce is on too. And maybe she could speak to that. I think she actually did speak with, um, with someone out there. Um, Joyce, are you on? Maybe she's not. Um, so, I'll follow up with you. I, I believe she said that she did speak to them and they didn't seem to have interest in having a conversation on that. Um, yeah, but pretty much we, the same with us. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> but we will, you know, continue to to be out there and I will definitely let her know, um, you know, maybe it's a group of people and maybe the person who was out there the day she was, wasn't the right person to speak to. So, um, you know, she is out every week updating the signage um, that gets torn down or vandalized or, um, so we, you know, we will try and, 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 you know, and catch them out there. And if there is, Michael, a specific time that you typically see, you know, see them out there, you know, please let us know and we'll try and be out at that during that time specifically. Um, uh, we'll do. And, and one last thing, I think just for, for everyone's uh, information, because I know there's been a lot of questions about the, the guerrilla gardeners, as we call them, that garden along the FDR path. Um, so my organization, Friends of Corley's Park, did invest in some standalone planters um, that we put in a different area of the park that some of those gardeners can utilize and actually three of them have been used already. Um, and we've purchased more and are putting those together this weekend as well. So we're, there'll be 18 of them now instead of 12. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there because I know there's been a lot of questions about where those gardeners can go now. And obviously we understand that what we're able to provide them is, is a fraction of what they're used to, but it's better than nothing. Uh, thank you, Michael. Right, Frank. Hey, thanks. I hope you can hear me. Uh, um, I'm not in a good zone. Um, uh, Frank, you may want to try you turning off your camera because you're choppy. Yeah. I don't know if that will help. Okay. How about that? Oh, much oh, better. My, much better. Is there any better? Okay. Kind sorry of, yeah. about that. Yeah, I'm not in a good zone for a reception. Um, so, quick question. Hey, Desiree. Um, I uh, had a quick question too. Uh, first is um, regarding the security. I was at a recent um, precinct meeting, the seventh precinct, and I understood that there was a, uh, I think what, what, what it was, was a phone, um, someone stole someone's phone in the park. But what, um, what occurred to me uh, that I hadn't realized before was that the police officers, at least at the meeting, my understanding was that they uh, mentioned that they, uh, only enter, um, so I'm talking about the 7th Precinct because there's different, obviously there's different jurisdictions, um, but the 7th pr uh, Precinct officers only enter through Houston uh, and they enter on foot. And I'm, I guess I probably don't remember correctly, but I was uh, confused because I thought originally there would be uh, entrance along uh, through where Montgomery is, uh, the beginning, you know, near Pier 42. Uh, but I've noticed that that has a fence, and I was just wondering, is that no longer available for, um, like, if police need to go into the park for anything um, via vehicle, or is this their own choosing? I, I don't know if you can answer this, but I was, it, it sort of struck me by surprise. So that's my first question. Yeah, so... And again, we're going to have further conversations to with the you know PEP Parks PEP and NYPD on you know where they need to have access. But 
the house and street entrance, as you know, is open, you know, so they can enter there on foot or bike. Um, and the, so the Montgomery street entrance, there is a, a gate there, um, but it is, you know, manned by a security, by security personnel when, um, when it is not in, during construction hours. So if NYPD or any other emergency um, group needed to get into the park or wanted to patrol the park, they can certainly um, enter through the Montgomery Street gate. That is for um, parks maintenance vehicles. Um, really, any vehicle that has to that wants to enter the park needs to enter at the Montgomery Street gate. So the Con Ed workers that are working at the North End, everyone needs to come through that gate. So it is you know, available for access should access need to be had. So um, we'll follow up with them as well on, you know, if they're not patrolling because they think they don't have access. Um, so, you know, we haven't heard that from them. And again, we we do kind of have- And, and I'm sorry, yeah, it. just to clarify, but this is, you answered the question. And just to clarify, I wasn't saying that they aren't patrolling as yeah. much as I was surprised by them saying that they only can enter um, on foot through the Houston overpass, but uh, it sounds like you guys are, if you haven't already, you'll be commencing a conversation. So thanks. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to clarify that I wasn't saying that they weren't patrolling. Um, yeah. I just was, she wasn't sure of their entry point. Um, my second question is, uh, as you might be well aware, and uh, I would assume a bunch of us uh, involved in this in the PA1 area are, uh, there are a lot of uh, messaging uh, going around about the piles uh, that are currently uh, in the park uh, and about people claiming that they're toxic and that they can't breathe and their throats are burning, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I just was wondering uh, if you could address that uh, specifically the known or unknown, uh, I mean, I guess you can't address the unknown, but the toxicities within the, those piles or just what that's about, I think a greater clarification would be warranted. Yep, sure. So I could definitely speak to that. Um, there were, again, in the colder months, um, the piles did not need to be tarped necessarily because the ground was frozen, the piles were frozen, there wasn't the need for tarping. Again, um, the the DEP um, protocols for, um, it's called stormwater and pollution prevention, which covers, you know, dust control, et cetera, um, are, you know, it, it's just not a, a one and done, you know, all piles need to be covered, all piles don't need, you know, there, there are lots of in and outs of the regulations that the contractors are following. Um, and once the weather started warming up, the contractors, again, started covering the piles. The piles are not toxic. The piles are not toxic. Um, the several piles are piles that are kind of from the earth of the park. Um, again, the contractor hasn't started any type of deep excavation. Um, so they are all kind of surficial excavation or you know, soil removal from the clearing and grubbing activities. Um, and then there are several piles that are kind of adjacent to those piles or next to those piles, which is clean material, um, which Con Edison has been using um, for some of the backfilling activities that they've been doing with the, um, oops, sorry, my cuckoo clock is gonna go off. Um, so, um, with the, some of the activities with the, um, the utility work that they've been doing, um, but, they, the, the piles are not toxic. Um, and again, there are certain requirements again for when the piles need to be watered down. Um, if a pile is being used, it does not need to be tarped all the time because it is an active pile. If a pile is you know, not being used as much, it, it needs to be tarped. So there are really a lot of, um, you know, we had the mitigation slide up at one of the last meetings and I did you know, speak to this briefly, briefly at the CB3 meeting. Um, the same thing with kind of trucks that have debris or soil in them, you know, if they're moving about on the site, it's not necessary for them to always be covered. Um, you know, the, the tracking pads are down for when uh, the trucks leave the site, uh, the tracking pads, you know, help with taking the sediment from the site um, <clears throat> off before they enter the street. Um, so there are a lot of different mitigation strategies on different levels, um, you know, 
and uh, you know we are following this the state and local and city um, regulations, guidelines, etc., with all of the stormwater and pollution prevention um, items. But I think that's a great point to bring up. I have noticed um, also on um, social media that um, there have been now like pile watching um, and you know, the piles are being sampled and that's how we know that they're non-toxic. Um, so, you know, everything is, is moving forward as outlined in the plans that were set up for the, for the project. But thank you for being okay, here. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a concern, um, you know, as for our residents, uh, of course, uh, yes. and it's a concern to parse out what's truth and what's not. Um, but let me just ask one quick follow up, uh, and I apologize for taking the time, but um, with regards to when it's deeper excavation, are you able to then say in those, um, when you approach that um, part of the project, then there would be toxicity concerns with those? Or I'm just trying to understand the mentioning of that they're not deeper underground, and um, a lot of them also are just fresh. Right. So, uh, you know, there are um, the soil samples have been taken, you know, as part of the FEIS and the design, um, you know, parts of the project. Um, so there are areas where there are known, for example, like MGP products, um, and there is um, extra monitoring that happens when, you know, the construction is in those areas. Um, so again, you know, that's part of, again, part of the air quality monitoring and just the overall monitoring for the project. Um, so, you know, when work happens in those areas, you know, kind of extra precautions are taken. Okay, thank you. Wendy? Um, I have a couple questions. And, um, you know, on Monday at the, around 3.30, I was at the walking past the Houston Gate. And I, even as I was like a block away, I could see big wafts of dust coming out of the tennis court area. And when I got into the park, I'm walking one way and walking the other way is tons of kids with baseball equipment. Are you thinking of putting an air quality monitor near the Houston gate? Um, I believe we have, I don't, I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen for a second. Um, we have, air quality monitors where the work is um, happening. And that measures the, again, kind of the upwind and downwind, um, um, you know, work that is happening. I'm trying to look to see if I have in the back. Um, um, there is one, there's one at, near the Stanton, the Stanton fence. There is, is one new? at the northern end of the project. Yeah, I'm sorry. That, is that brand new? Because it wasn't on your map from last month. It was, the closest one was all the way on the other side of the bridge. And yet this is where people are walking. There's a ball field right there where kids are starting to play. Um, so that's why I'm concerned is there's so many people right in that area. And there's tons of trucks. And, you know, there's definitely work going on there. Yeah, from what I understand, there is one um, near the Stanton Street fence, and that should be on that map. I don't have it in the deck that I have here tonight, which I thought I did. Um, but but I can, you know, I could look into that and send over the. Because I don't think I don't think that that it's there yet. What about the request I made for monitors at the uh, Ma Montgomery Gate? Yeah, again, there isn't work that's happening down at the end. By Montgomery. There, there's a lot of idling though, isn't there? Truck idling. If they're going over these pads and every big thing has to come in and out through the same gate. Aren't there vehicles idling there? Um, I could, I'll check in with that again, Wendy, but it's, you know, it's my understanding that it's where the, you know, construction activities are and that kind of takes into account the trucks that are coming in and out. So you have a new sensor that's right near the um, old you know, it's south of the bridge, it's solar powered, and it's on a post. Do you know what that is? Is that a sensor for sound? We were trying to figure it out that far from where the Delancey Bridge's work is. I believe the sensors that are up there are 
air and noise. I'm not sure if they all have noise, um, but they are air quality so monitoring. Because this is new with solar. And speaking of solar, um, when I wrote you about adding lighting near that Stanton Traverse, and this would also apply down by Corlears, can we mm -hmm. have solar lighting? There was solar lighting arrays in the park before construction began, and it seems like they're portable. They could be moved back and put back in place. People do not want more diesel fumes, more, um, you know, that those glaring lights that the, I tend to be put out temporarily, we'd really like to see something that's a little more welcoming and ecological. So um, solar please for that. And my last comment is at CB3, I asked you and I followed up and I asked you about, instead of buying a, um, you know, this expensive temporary bridge at Corlears, why not open up Pier 42 so that people can get to the ferry from the south end of the park? that would maybe avoid something like 10 to $25 million for a temporary bridge installation, deinstallation, and get people you know, walking through the areas that, yeah, you'd have to add a little bridge or some kind of connector between Pier 42 and um, the preserved pathway that's right along the water. Um, has that been followed up? You said you'd take it back to the team. Yes, I did take it back to the team. Um, Pier 42 is currently under construction with EDC and parks. Um, so that is an active construction zone there. So they can't have pedestrians walking in that area. Obviously, um, I mean, when construction is done this summer, you've said repeatedly, so they'll be open this summer. That's not very long from now. It's already, you know, almost April. Right, so the temporary bridge needs to go up in order for the Corlears and Park bridge work to move forward, um, and that needs to stay on schedule again to make the schedule. So um, I believe that at this point they are moving forward with the, the temporary bridge. Could you ask please, and just make sure because to me it's like a huge expense. And, and Wendy, I know that this was also, I know that the request to try to alternate has been asked a few times. Will, I think I think it's been exhausted at this point. Um, Charles, um, can we move on? Charles, do you have a question? Yeah, Desiree, um, there seems to be a lot of construction by Con Ed going on. Is there any oversight by you guys on the Con Ed work? And if not, um, how, do we, how do we know what they're doing? I mean, they're right, right along the uh, pathway at Houston Street. That whole entrance is being closed up by Con Ed right near all those ball fields. Is there any way of monitoring that or do they have a representative that could come to these meetings and talk about actually what they're doing? Sure, Charles, that's, I mean, I believe, and I will have to get back to you on that. I believe the, you know, the monitoring that we're doing covers is inclusive of that work as well. Um, I will, you know, confirm that for you and definitely send an email over to Paula and Tara, mm -hmm. um, you know, as soon as I check in with that tomorrow. Um, and then I'm, you know, I, I could find out about if there would be a separate Con Ed representative. I did provide um, a slide in, I think it was two CAGs ago about the work that is happening there. So if it's specifically on what that work is, um, you know, I think it was two CAGs ago. It was, you know, that they're, um, you know, um, upgrading static lines there. Yeah. And then they're providing extra support for the park that's going on top of it now. So um, we know what work is happening there, but as far as kind of what the oversight is like for the kind of work that I'd have to get back to you on. It's just so very close to those ball fields right there. And, um, and I know you told us what they were doing. I just am not sure how any, if anybody has an oversight of a kind of in the entire world. I mean, it's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a larger, I guess it's more of a global question because kind of sure. such a huge unit, but that's- No, but I, I, will, I will check in to see what that looks like and get back to you on that. That's a good yeah, you question. You said it's gonna be all summer there. So it's gonna be really close to those kids playing ball. That's all I'm concerned with. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Charles. Christine? Uh, <clears throat> hi. Um, I also have a question about that Con Edison work and also a comment about what just happened. 
Um, how long was this Con Edison work actually scheduled to be? Or, um, you know, you're saying now it's going into the summer. What is, um, how much, how, um, what was the previous estimate when that would be wrapped up? So the Con Edison work in the shared use path was scheduled for at least a year or so in different sections up the shared use path. Um, and a lot of it depends on, again, you know, what the subsurface conditions are and Con Ed things that, uh, you know, they're Con Ed. So they, you know, they can, they, they're- So, okay, let, let, me ask, let me ask the question a little bit differently then. Um, does Con Ed now say it's going to take them longer than expected? Um, I think, you know, I could, I, we only asked for the duration for this portion of work here, you know, in, in coordinating with parks for the ball fields. I can come back and see if they have a longer projected, you know, um, schedule for the full length of work, um, or if it's this particular section because of certain reasons. So I'm not 100% sure on that, and I definitely can, can go back and ask. Um, but we were told that this section of work will continue into the summer. Okay, great. Um, my concern is that uh, with that work is that all the construction vehicles that uh, now have to travel past uh, Stanton Street or go uh, to the upper part of, um, of the park are really affecting the uh, esplanade. Uh, Con Edison is also doing work on their plant uh, that's not even in East River Park. There is at least, um, I would say, 10 cars every day there. And um, it's great to have an open park, uh, but especially uh, the Christine, you're frozen. Oh, okay. Christine, you froze for a moment. Um, okay, I will turn my uh, video off. Uh, people will come into the park now with the warmer weather, and it's a real issue because uh, you will have, um, you know, a whole bunch of people uh, in the park, and you will have a lot of uh, a lot of cars, a lot of construction uh, vehicles going up and down the esplanade because that's the only way they they can come and leave the park. And I think we really need to think about that a little bit deeper. And also, um, you had mentioned that Section J uh, was going to close sometime soon. Uh, and I also want to really bring bring that up because that's really red flags of like yet again an active construction site where all the vehicles will basically squeeze on the esplanade while at the same time the park is in its heaviest season of being used. Um, the other comment that I have is that um, I really don't feel that the answer that uh, when these answers, uh, when these questions were answered in any professional matter here, and I also don't appreciate uh, this just being shut down like this. Uh, I think it's a very valid point. Um, what uh, I think uh, I agree with Wendy about is that we need to create areas for people to walk along the water and an access road like that would do that. And I think we need to uh, put a little bit more effort into this than just say, uh, gen just doing generalized um, statements here about, oh yeah, um, it's just not possible. It's an active construction site. It's the summer, blah, blah, blah. I think it's uh, very disappointing to hear, um, to hear no effort really being made to really address this and uh, discuss that with the committee. Thanks. Thanks. Um... I will, you know, I will take everything back. I, I will continue to look into this folder again. We and talked and about Desiree, Desiree, you did bring this, you did, I believe at our last meeting, actually provide a pretty thorough reason as to why any alternatives to what's currently being proposed is not feasible. So I, you know, to their credit, I, you know, I, I understand it's not the most ideal, it's not the most ideal situation, but it was something that had been brought back and had been discussed. And I believe at the last meeting, Desiree provided an adequate example or excuse me, adequate reasons as to why. Um, Wendy's proposing another alternative. Desiree has indicated that she will go back again and try. And that's the most we can do at this point. You know, we're just really trying to make sure that we move on and make sure that people's questions are answered. With that, Robin and then uh, Trevor. Well, my point is that yeah, the questions I, I are not you. being answered. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. I, I, I agree with you, Christine, and I want to thank you for bringing that up because, you know, obviously we are concerned about this temporary bridge. It's not something that we're just, you know, if we're the CAG group and we're, and we're here to just make suggestions, but nothing gets done, then what's the point? I, I think this is brought up many times because we're seeing this as a problem and we want a resolution to it. We don't, and, and, and I guess the answers we're getting, we're not satisfied. So I think, you know, uh, I brought it up myself about why, why can't we do something else? Why do we have to create this bridge and tear trees and, and all that? So this is not something that I think we're, we, we want to just, you know, push it aside. It's, gave our, we got our answer. We're done. Like, that's the whole point of us, you know, having this CAG group. And I, and I want to thank you for bringing that up again. Um, Cause I'm also, it's also very troubling to me. Excuse me. Oh, just moving. I mean, Rob, did you have something else to say, or because we? I was just calling on Trevor for because he's on staff. Oh, I, I stopped. Okay, yeah, that's how. Just that's I said, Trevor. That's I wasn't sure. Sorry if I had interrupted you. That's okay. No, you did not. Is it okay to go now? Yeah, I was about, yeah go ahead, Trevor. Okay, I'm just making sure. Uh, just some clarification points with regards to Pier 42. There are two sections. One of them is scheduled to be completed this summer, and the other one is not scheduled to be completed until next summer, correct? Yes, correct. There's the upland and the um, pier. And both the, the both the temporary bridges and the permanent bridges were under the plan uh, that we all approved in uh, a lot of meetings about. Uh, these aren't new temporary bridges that we just figured out. So we looked at these for many years and discussed them for many years. And that is correct, right? I believe so. I apologize that I wasn't in those meetings, but it is my understanding that the, definitely the permanent bridges and from what I believe the temporary bridge as well, because we right. need to have, provide access to the um, ferry at all times. And I'm just trying to, to point out that it's, that it's important that we stay and we understand that we're talking about issues going forward and not going back and looking at or trying to change plans that we have approved um, at multi multi levels and, and and i'd certainly like to see that little pathway that i believe a con ed owns opened up for a connection point and we're still been working on that for two decades uh, to get that little pathway open but i think to talk about not installing a bridge especially without really going back to people who live there in that area and the fact that it'd be easy for those folks to cross over is, is maybe not an area we should be going into if we're going to talk about how we move forward and discuss issues. But that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. All right, Frank, then Wendy. Yeah, thanks, Trevor, actually, because I think that's really important. You made several points. I don't agree, actually, and I don't understand, actually, why, because someone speaks at the CAG that they think they're speaking for the CAG. Uh, I don't understand the, I feel that I, I brought this up at the community board meeting. The idea of moving that bridge means that you would also be, I mean, there's so much complexity I have to imagine, but you'd be closing the entrance to the ball field over there. Uh, and it's a lower grade. And, uh, you know, I think it's just also important that, you know, that we have to figure out as a CAG how we're messaging. Just because two people speak the loudest does not mean that it's a we for the CAG. And I think as Trevor pointed out, these were in the plans before, and it's not really fair because people didn't pay attention or notice that there were things that were involved in this project and then they bring it up at the last hour uh, and try to change something when, you know, again, I, I don't even understand the rationale for the bridge moving it over to Jackson. Uh, because you're, I mean, you're talking, there are so many, I thought you were clear about there's so many different issues involved, but in any case, it's just a, it's the, I, I I'm, I'm appreciative of Trevor's comment and, and also that, you know, one or two people speaking up does not make we for the CAG. Wendy? So just to clarify, I'm not talking about Jackson Street at all. I'm talking about not having a temporary bridge, Frank, and instead, you know, some of the ferry users may well be coming from the south anyhow. All ferry users could enter at Montgomery Street cross over Pier 42, which will be open by this summer, correct? And there's a little gap and they can continue along the water's edge. You know, they gated off 
the whole promenade or esplanade, whatever you call it, south of the ferry in January of 2021. It's preserved. It's not torn up like the rest of the, much of the rest of the esplanade to the south. So it would be very easy to reopen that gate so people could come back in. Essentially it needs a, uh, there's about 150 feet that need a, a, a land bridge, something that people can walk on safely, far away from the construction. Um, that, that area, um, as far as I know, south of the ferry, has been used only for parking by construction vehicles. So those cars could park in the end, in the parking lot that's right beside it, that's, as far as I know, still at least a third empty. So thank you for pulling that up. This is great. This, so you people can see what I'm talking about. It's just beyond where it says reach A that Montgomery comes in. And you can see where the ferry is. It's actually hard to see, but it's just below. You, we all know where it is. To me, ferry users have been prioritized in this overall plan and not necessarily the concerns of other kinds of park users have been treated the same way. So here's a chance to just think about what's a problem at this end, a way to preserve some of the existing trees cheaper. Maybe it's saving 10 to $25 million. I'm not an engineer, but when you think about the cost of building, transporting, installing, deinstalling, a whole bridge that's going to be used for what, two years? I don't know. Is it worth it? Can we think about it another way? And then I'll stop there. But thank you very much for letting me explain this again. Thanks, Wendy. And just to reiterate Trevor's point, there's the Pier 42 deck, which is the green part here, which is scheduled to be completed. Um, <clears throat> again, scheduled to be completed in the summer of this year. And then there's the Pier 42 Upland, which is this whole area, which is not scheduled to com be completed until the following summer. So this area will still be under construction for a longer period of time. I understand. And this is where um, using the upper deck, and I know there's a walkway right along the water's edge because I, I really looked at that plan closely. So have the people going to the ferry follow the, along the water's edge, not close to the, on the other side where there's construction. If it's open, it's open. Let's use it. Rob and then Frank. I just would like to clarify that what I'm saying here are all my opinions, like Trevor said, they were his opinions. Um, I do want to point out though that, you know, there was a vote, uh, what, seven years ago on a plan for this park that was changed. So whether there's votes on things or not, changes do happen and can be made. And if there are new eyes looking at these plans on the CAG, then fresh new eyes that are saying, hey, wait a minute, this is something I see as a potential problem. I think it's worth uh, either a discussion. If there's a vote, then we vote. However, we work as a CAG. But I, 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 I um, uh, again, I don't appreciate comments that are you know, talking about the people are speaking for the we. Is there a we? There's a we or there's not a we. If it's all our, our personal opinions, and then, then that needs to be stated. Frank? Yeah, um, I, I'm not clear here. Uh, the advocacy is to limit the access to the park uh, so that to make people walk further to get into to go over, it just doesn't make sense. And as far as the we, I was only commenting on what was said. Uh, and I know that equity is an issue here in the CAG because when it was brought up, there was some um, outrage to that. But again, uh, I'm not putting Trevor on the hot seat here, but I think he it was well-spoken when he said to go to the um, those directly affected. And my hat right now is on Lower East Side East River Residence Committee, of which there are representatives in NYCHA subsidized housing all over the waterfront but I do live in Gouverneur Gardens. I live right adjacent to Corlieres Hope Park. And uh, I, I, it's just, it's a little confusing because now late in the hour, the advocacy is to like not even have a, a temporary bridge so that you limit people moving and accessing the park eventually. I'm just not clear, but um, I, it sounds like we should have further discussions internally on how we represent ourselves and opinions and we's. So I'm, I'm just happy to say this is my idea to come from the South. Um, 
And it comes from looking closely at these drawings and realizing that it wasn't, wouldn't limit access. It might make it more accessible to people from the South who are South of the air of Corlears than they are, than it is right now. But- Wendy, I just want to point out, I don't mean to interrupt, I'm not trying to be rude, but I'm, just so you know, we, we already have access with crossing um, over to the Pier 36 on Montgomery Street uh, because it's a four-way intersection. So you have to remember no. that as well. I know, that's fantastic. And people could even walk all that way along. I'm sorry, Tara, excuse me, Tara. Hi, Ophelia Rivas. Sorry. Uh, sorry, we're going over time and in respect of our consultants and agencies who are here. Um, I think we need to table this. Desiree has responded several times on this topic. It seems we're at an impasse and this topic is a larger conversation. EDC is involved, you know, so it's not just Desiree or DDC making the decisions. So I understand that everyone is passionate and we can go back and forth. However, we need to move it along because yeah. it's already coming up to 5.30. Thank you. Thank you, Ophelia. And I thank you for, for being patient. So let's finish the presentation so we can allow the agency folks to leave and then we can continue the conversation. Sure, the presentation is yeah. over. All right. all yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, we again, CAG members, we can continue the conversation. The, if there are any other um, questions related to the presentation that do not involve the, the temporary bridge and the pier. All right. Um, so thank you again, Desiree and the rest of the agency folks for being here. You all are free to, to leave. We'll take one minute just to, to regroup. Um, so actually, yeah, just a minute or two just to regroup. If somebody wants to take a quick bio break at 5.30, um, the CAG portion will begin. Thank, thank you. you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Give you a few more seconds to rejoin. <clears throat> okay, so it's 530. We have half an hour left. Um, and I, you know, we just had a contentious conversation about the temporary bridge and the pier, but given that um, 
We've talked about this um, several times before. I'm proposing that we wait for Desiree to come back with um, another response to the, to the question about doing things differently, but let's spend the little time that we have left um, talking about some issues that we can really try to influence um, as this project continues to move forward. Um, and Tara and I, I'm gonna turn it over to her, but um, we wanted to again, bring up the issue of, of phasing and the fact that you guys have not gotten the, the level of information and detail that, um, that you need about you know, future parts of the uh, park that are closed and how you're gonna access the parts that are open um, and things of that sort. So, um, Tara, did you wanna, do you wanna say anything else about that to sort of frame our proposal about how we want to um, push DDC to be more responsive and, and proactive about phasing moving forward? Yeah, I think I think that's pretty much it. For the most part, I do know that there's information that you all feel is just not being communicated. Um, I want us to be specific in our ask to DDC to make sure that they're providing um, consistent, regular, useful, um, timely information for the CAC to be able to respond to as things move forward. Um, I know that this just looking through our priorities, it just um, it looks like to some degree everything that we've already or addressed or raised as areas of concern, such as like the amenities, things of that sort, you know, with the amenity map, um, when he made suggestions for additions to that map at this meeting that they'll take back, but ultimately they have not really made much movement as to how they will be um, providing phasing and scheduling information moving forward. So this is where I wanted us to have a discussion. I would wanna gather that information um, to bring to DDC to figure out how best to get that information um, to the CAG and for, for us to be able to use and be able to, again, in, impact and have questions and be able to move forward on areas of concern that have yet to come down. So I'm opening it up. Um, I don't wanna put anyone on the spot specifically, but um, Diane, I know that this was something that you've raised quite a bit. Um, so if there are things that you feel that like in terms of like what we need to be what, what either the format um, level of specifics as it relates to phasing um, that we should be letting we should be getting from DDC that would be really useful. Yeah, I, I mean, I think my biggest concern right now is that the information that we get when we get it, it's not timely. It's taking them months to answer every letter and you know, we spent a lot of time putting together a letter that asked a lot of really, you know, pretty detailed questions about um, how the closures would happen and how amenities would be accessible and that kind of thing um, before the big closing in December. And by the time we got the answer, the answers were things like, yeah, the south end of the park is closed now, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and that, that I think is the biggest concern. Um, why is it taking so long? I think that we can, we do, and we can do a good job because of, you know, outlining what our questions are. We have a lot of people who are really familiar with the park, you know, whether it's to use the ball fields or just to go in there, you know, individually, who understand where all the amenities are, but we're, we don't get the answers in a timely way. And then we are losing any opportunity to influence the decisions. Um, no, I mean, obviously they're sort of a closed park. What I mean is like where the paths are, where the access points are, you know, kind of things like that. Trevor? I would agree with Diana. And one of the things we had talked about a couple of months ago is really focusing on the things we want to do and trying to figure out what that is. We, we do post questions to uh, the team as a CAG, but each individual member also posts questions. So at the end of the day, they have a hundred or so questions to answer and they're answering them from CAG members because they're CAG members. But I think if we can focus on what we'd like to do as a CAG and, gener and just get a, a, you know, a set of questions that we, and, that we can present to them, I think it'd be much more productive because I know on that end, they get a lot of questions from people. And to be honest, 60 or 70% of them have already been answered before or are not relevant to what we're doing. But if we're gonna move forward and have impact on this project, 
with phasing, because we talked about phasing probably about four months ago, and we really didn't make any movement at all, because uh, we spend too much time in the first portion, that we have to figure out what's, what our priorities are. Um, I know one of the things that I think part of, I mean, yeah, I mean, for, I do feel like, and if, please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it, I do think that might, it could be the, that the conversation is difficult because you all don't have adequate information as it stands. You all feel like you have a level of understanding as to like what's going to be happening in the park and in around approximately which dates in order for you to be able to, to Yeah, to get the to get the questions that you because that doesn't seem to be I I may be wrong because I again I mean I've, Trevor someone like you've been in, who's been involved in this project for years and years and years may have a better grasp but I'm just not sure if it's clear across the CAG that people understand what exactly is happening and again you may not know what's going to happen three months from now but you do to some degree know what's going to be impacted in around what time like, is that something that you all have a grasp of. It would be really nice to see the whole plan, you know, even the, if they could share the, uh, the GC's timeline, I think that would make things much clearer to us, the general contractor, if they would share that, because then we'll really see the overall scope. And I don't remember the temporary bridge, Trevor, and maybe other people do. But I feel like that's something new. We didn't even know the Corlears Bridge was going to be replaced until, what, three years ago? Was that maybe? Well, I don't, I don't want to get into a discussion about the bridge because we said we're going to pass it. But okay. if you just look at that map, why would you want to close off <laughs> an access point to the, the, to the East River? It, I can understand you should be advocating for both, to be honest, and, and an entrance from the south and to keep the bridge, not closing off a whole section and then opening up, but we should we we really should just move on and talk about the what our priorities are in terms of questions. Okay, I agree. And to me, the you know we I sent this question late to um, Tara and Paula, but we don't know is there a dewatering plan? We don't know what they're doing to protect the waterway. We don't know um, so much about you know when they do start digging deep. What is the plan? If we look at, I don't feel very confident from what I see right now. It that, you know, but maybe I'm over overreacting. But if you're in the park these days, and I don't know if people have gone, the intensity of the experience is really different. And it's partly the noise level from the no longer having the filter. But to me, the environmental and health aspects are really key. And that's why I asked about alternative spaces for walkers and bicyclers today. Could they put that on the map? Diane? Was somebody gonna say something? <clears throat> no, I think Paul um, and I just said her name at the same time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was just gonna say, look, I, I think that, I think a couple things that were especially obvious today, particularly when Ophelia jumped in, <clears throat> I don't think as a CAG, we have come to an agreement about what our priorities are. And we are displaying our lack of unity in front of the city. And that is a guarantee that we will not have any influence over what's happening. Unless, I, or I will say that I think the moments where we have been able to influence things, where we've taken a stand and gotten what we asked for was in those moments where we spontaneously came together. Uh, for example, uh, around the, um, you know, the crushing of, you know, perfectly good equipment during the demolition and, and, you know, deciding to ask for an inventory and repurposing and all that. We did a good job on that. But I think that we have not come to an agreement that there are a million issues here that we could tackle. We're not going to be able to tackle all of them. We're going to have to pick and choose. I think that we are going to be stronger and more influential with the city if we can hash that out amongst ourselves and then speak about that in public. And in our defense, I will say that I think the last minute change to the phasing plan that we have now probably did make it harder to follow what was going on. You know, all the years that people invested in this, no matter when they got involved, 
involved the, uh, the old plan, then the old phasing plan. Now we have a newer phasing plan. And there are some questions that have come up that are not well resolved. And I would propose that we take the time to figure out what we can agree on, what we, where we can find common ground on how to set our priorities and have a set of issues that we're all going to get behind and show some unity to the city. Damaris? The tape is still running. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's it's my, it, the live it's stream. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so thank everybody for their comments. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I kind of agree um, with Diane um, around like we're not in a in a unified space, but I, I feel like I need to also say that. I think that part of the reason that we're not approaching this issue from a unified place is because we're not unified, right? I think that there are varying opinions about what should be happening and that there are, you know, various different uh, goals, um, you know, being held up by different CAG members. Um, and that's okay in some way, but I think that is the real issue. And I also would like to say that I feel that there's a real issue of trust for me in this space um, because I'm in this space with other community members that Frank, I'd can like you, to be Sorry, come on. Maris, Frank, can you mute your phone? Yeah, he did. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thank you, Trevor. Um, I think that you know, what's important to me in a space like this is to understand that I am working with a team of people that are all invested in really seeing something move forward in a positive way. And I get we are various places, but there is a real erosion of trust even amongst this, you know, where people are like attacking each other on social media and other spaces. And then it makes it really hard to come here and work with all of you um, and try to find common ground. That's a very difficult thing to do. And so, you know, for whatever it is worth, you know, I would like to, you know, ask folks to be really mindful of how they are responding, respecting, and portraying one another when everybody is coming to the space because we all care about this neighborhood. Right. And if we care about this neighborhood, then we should be caring about each other. Because I, you know, the neighborhood and the buildings don't mean anything to me without the people. So I'm, I'm going to come to this CAG and I'm going to be a part of this CAG. Yes, I want to see us unified. I want to see us more focused, but I want to see us at least have some agreements in this space, right? That I can, you know, rest my hat on and trust that we are all moving, you know, with the best intentions at heart. And just for the record, I want to say, you know, we're talking a lot about the park and what's not pretty and what's uncomfortable. The graffiti is not pretty either. Okay, the park is fine. The, the, all of those kind of things, you know, make it difficult. And these comments and going back and forth make it crazy for me. And I'm at my wits end with this with this CAG. I'm just saying. And I have been involved in this process since day one. And if you know that, and if you know me and you know the work that we've been doing, you know that that is absolutely true. And I'm about to like quit if we can't figure out how to be more productive and effective in this space. And that is what I, that is the only thing I wanted to say. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Damaris. I think for us, especially again, given that people do have the diverging views on this project, I do think at least at the very, you know, at the very least making sure and compelling DDC to give the, the most specific specified schedule moving forward, I think is the best way for us to get unified get on the same page. And people, if they have their questions and, or, you know, other areas of concern can get those addressed in with this information. So ultimately I do, you know, I do want us to at least like moving forward um, put together what our ask is going to be as it relates to phasing um, immediately, compel DDC to respond 
um, immediately before additional um, you know, closures and, and detours and diversions take place um, so that we can move ahead with our subsequent meetings, especially with CB3, knowing what's ahead and how we can impact any you know, areas of concern with that. Um, so with that, uh, I'm sorry, I just realized, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're, that we're all at least clear on the same page as, as far as what our ask is. Um, definitely like the GC construction schedule as, as it relates to order of activities. Um, you know, I imagine they're probably not, you know, they're, for what time period is this something that we want for the next six months? Do you want this for the next year? Do you want the entire timeline? How best do you all think you can work together to um, really analyze and look at what's coming down um, as it relates to construction activities and how you'd like to address them? Well, to me, it makes sense to ask for the whole plan because every time we, it's, it, we're always too late. So how can we have an effect if we don't can see more than a year ahead? So if we could have see the over, overview, I think it would really help. And to me, one of the CAG things I wonder, could, is the CAG interested in the park user's experience? Is that something, you know, like increased lighting and security? I was there the other day and people are picnicking on the nice days You've seen them, Diane, right? On the teeniest little pieces of grass. And there's only a few people there now. What's going to happen when there's thousands of people in the park at a time? I'm, I'm just worried about the experience of, you know, it's open and it, you should be able to really use it and enjoy it. How can we make that better? Is that something we want to do? I don't know. Trevor? As we all know, the plans change and any of the construction dates that they give us change constantly. And if you read the advisories, I think the coalesced hook work has been moved, coalesced hook work has been moved four times. So I think maybe a six month lookout for construction would be helpful because I know from a contractor standpoint, they have an overall long-term goal, but it's never achieved from, a, from, from this standpoint, meaning phasing. So I think if we can look six months ahead, um, that'd be extremely helpful just for the phasing portion because they're not gonna know the construction due to weather and unforeseen circumstances and all that, but a six month uh, window would be probably be most helpful and productive. Do other people have feedback or ideas about how we can um, get more information about phasing? No, I just made a comment in chat. This is Christina and I'm keeping my camera off so I don't wobble again. But, you know, yeah, the phasing, uh, the new phasing, which, you know, I would say makes a lot of sense, you know, to close the park, uh, the southern part and then the northern part. But then let's not forget that uh, the Con Edison work was nothing that was even discussed when we got this phasing plan first introduced. So, you know, so things constantly change and then, uh, you know, we being presented and I don't say it's bad, you know, of course, uh, oh yeah, everybody's so happy that Con Edison is doing this uh, now so they don't have to rip up a brand new park once it's done. Great, you know, I agree with that. Uh, I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, but it changes how the phasing works it changes how the community can use this park and we have to have a discussion about that. And I think there is no discussion about that. There is no discussion about how are people really going to enjoy a walk along the river? It's going to be non-existing because we will have heavy construction vehicles on the esplanade during working hours. And, you know, I think that that's another layer of complexity that uh, the city is just like, you know, we're just being, you know, told, uh, you know, um, you know, and I think the CAG had another win when we all pushed back and said, why would you close the entire uh, service road and uh, we have no access to the amenities. And I think it's the same discussion still that uh, we would, that we pushed back on earlier, um, uh, late last year. And uh, then they said, okay, we're going to 
uh, the Con Edison work, we're not going to close the entire service road because they couldn't give us an answer how we can actually access the park in a meaningful way. So um, just let's remember that too, that we are constantly being asked to also be flexible about new, uh, and this is a complex project. I'm not saying that, but you know, I, I think they also need to have more discussions with us back and forth about uh, things that come up and how that changes um, how we can still use the open portions of the park. Robin? Hi. Uh, besides, um, you were asking how we can, you know, have a more active role or know things in advance. Um, besides the way things are working now, is there any opportunity? I mean, we're, we're having, you know, presentations monthly and email correspondence, but is there any opportunity for a CAG member to go to meetings, you know, to have more of an active participation that way so that it's not just Desiree who's reporting to us, but we're getting, you know, weekly intel from the inside. Diane? Yeah, I, you know, I think we, we, we're spending a lot of time talking about the park experience, and that is certainly important. Um, we, when, you know, before all the voting took place and this plan was approved, I think the community made it pretty clear that still having access to part of the park through phasing was very, very important to them, even as they understood the need to build flood protection. Um, but I think when at the beginning of the CAG, I was looking through some notes today, we were also asking, you know, other questions. We were asking about the schedule. We were asking about the budget. Uh, we were asking about, you know, um, when will parts of the flood wall be complete? And we were asking a broader set of questions. And I think that speaking of trust and speaking of what matters to people, that we on the CAG need to kind of get all these issues out on the table and come to an agreement about what matters uh, to everybody. And that might be a subset of all the issues that there are, uh, because there's so much that, that, you know, this is such a huge project. And fortunately, any individual organization or representative in this team can then go off and advocate for or work hard on issues that the CAG may choose not to tackle. But I think that, you know, if we, that we need to take a step back and understand not just what matters to, you know, those of us who say a lot in the CAG meetings, but to maybe some of our, our colleagues who are able to attend regularly or don't attend regularly because they're frustrated and to come to some kind of an agreement about, okay, here are the big topics that we're going to tackle. And then you know, individual organization, if you have something else that you really feel passionate about and you really want to advocate for that, then, you know, you go do your thing. And if that becomes important to everyone else in the community, you know, we can kind of pull it back into the CAG and do what we need to do. But I think that's where we need to start because everything, everything, um, we can't do everything. Yeah. And I don't think that everything is of interest to everybody. And Paula, did we share out the, the, you know, last month we had that prioritizing session. Did we share out the document with everyone? Because like basically in, in looking at that document, um, a lot of the things that were listed were things that we had either like we had submitted letters for or we knew were like being prioritized. So, like I know the, the, um, the tennis house, which um, the DDC is assuring us we're going to get some, some response from OMB very shortly on that and um, that they're working on that. Um, the air filter letter, which we just re recently got out, um, the question around amenities, which um, Desiree addressed today in terms of as at least um, where people can find access that information. A lot we had kind of, we we've seen movement on those things. It just seemed like the one overarching thing, which is really you know like the overall umbrella is really was like phasing that really hadn't we really haven't been as successful. Um, but I do think we we if we haven't circulated that document, we can recirculate it. Um, and hopefully have a more robust conversation um, to either add to it 
or um, really like, you know, pick one or two of those items. But I feel like all of like everything we we had listed last month was has is in motion except for phasing. Um, Damaris. In the spirit of being um, collaborative, I'm going to say that I think what we should do is ask every CAG member to take a look at this laundry list of things that we thought were important and pick a few of those and submit those as their top, I don't know, two, three, four things maybe. And then maybe put them all together so that we can all weigh in on the same set of things and determine what is important to us. So uh, maybe that's a survey. Maybe we, we, we create the list, all the cap, we do it in two parts. They pick their top three. Then we take all of those top threes, we put them all together and then ask everybody to sort of rank them or vote on them in some ways. And then at least we can have a starting point for these five to 10 issues or two issues or three, however many they are, are the issues that all of you care about and all of you can get behind. And then once we have that, we can determine of those, which ones we tackle first and start to focus our energy united on those issues that all of us have found some level of common ground around. That's one suggestion for a path forward. Thank you. I see some raised thumbs. And I wondered, could you put the list up briefly, Paula or Tara, that you made? Could we look at it for one second in the last minute? Uh, sure. Thanks. One of the things in my work is we have a thing called rig roys. We have a process of where we document and we record all these issues where people could go in, we could see what they are. When they respond back, you could, you know, attach those documents back to it. And it's a system that we can all see what these issues and you could also set priorities and we could, you know, be able to prioritize, you know, what we what's our number one issue, number two issue, et cetera. And we it doesn't mean that the other ones aren't being addressed. We will allow us to be able to see everything and follow up, meaning if someone has a question, instead of them inundating them with lots of the same questions repeatedly, we should be able to see and go straight in and say, hey, was this addressed already? Um, and perhaps that will allow, you know, resources not to be lost. Um, just a thought, you know, some type of tool like, you know, as I, I use Jira, which is, you know, which is, it's a software tool, but I'm sure there's has to be other project management tools out there that, you know, we could utilize. And we do have our log, which um, of, que of questions as well, um, which I believe is st still being updated. You all have, we've sent you the link um, to fit for as reference for people to go back to. And I know we've been also using that and following up with DDC to resolve any outstanding questions. And I don't know if there are, I mean, apart from what's been asked this past month, I don't believe there are still any um, outstanding. Well, I'm about that. Robin? Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted, I think it's a great idea uh, to go through the list um, and, and to have everyone choose, you know, what is priorities. I just want to clarify um, something or get some clarification. So when we're talking about what our priorities are, I'm assuming that we're talking about what the priorities of our constituency that we're representing are, right? So my, these are not just my personal or our personal things, but you know, what the Hillman community, who I represent, wants. And I'm wondering, so I'm, I'm assuming that that's what we're talking about. Um, and I also at this wondering if, if we, perhaps it's time, and I don't know if it's the CAG's role to do this, but to, get community feedback at this point. Maybe we share this list with the entire community affected by this construction to find out, again, you know, are we in line? Uh, are we being reflective and responsive to what our community's asking us to do? It's been a while, you know, I think. Um, Damaris, and then I, um, we're at six. So we, uh, Damaris, and then we're going to close out. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think every group should do whatever it is they need to do 
respectfully to determine what the priorities are of the people that they represent. So if you want to put it and share it with your membership, do that. But I think yeah. we should have a timeline so we can respond. It should be soon. And so we can get on with it and we can get closer because it is getting warm out. <clears throat> and if we're concerned about things, we better get cracking. And I do also want to say that I, you know, I, I want to see the park. I literally am across the street. One of these days, I'm going to show you all from my window. <laughs> but you know, let us also be mindful that while we are doing this, we can also be letting people know about all the other wonderful, beautiful parks and gardens that are in this neighborhood that people can also enjoy passively that are not being utilized um, fully in any real way. And it's, you know, a missed opportunity for people to learn about these other spaces in their neighborhood and get part of what they need. They may not be able to ride bike and skateboards in some of these places, I get it, but they can certainly sit at a bench, and maybe have a barbecue or a picnic or do something. Thank you. All right, so we will circulate that list. Um, I still, I think just in the sense of urgency, it seems like we all are at least on the same page as it relates to phasing. So that's something that we will, um, Paul and I will either draft a letter to circulate for you all to look at. Um, I think just in the, just so we can get some other um, people around that um, request as well. Um, but then overall priorities moving forward, we, we can recirculate that document so we can prioritize um, for next month. Um, again, we'll send you all the meeting requests for the next CB3 meeting. We continue to, um, most of you do already attend that meeting, but again, we continue to encourage you to do so, which helps supplement this meeting. We're still not at that point where we were hoping the DDC portion would be shorter, but hopefully we will get there soon. At least we're not getting too redundant. Um, and we will see you all next month, um, but we will be, and um, I believe also we will be voting on the laws now that we have quorum on on voting on the bylaws, we will now move ahead with that. And so please expect to get an email next week with the draft um, bylaws to review and for your vote. And if you can vote as soon as you can, please, that would be great. That would also assist us in making sure that we're able to move things ahead. Um, if you see our emails asking to vote, please just take the five minutes to review and vote. Yeah, I like that too, by the way. I think that's helpful. Definitely, thank you. All right, so yes, well, uh, we're already I, we're taking more time from you all. So thank you all, and have a great week. Bye, everybody. Bye.